Well, thank you. Yeah, recording progress, so I get to tell this story. Thank you for inviting me, and thank you for uh, showing up tonight uh, to talk about not the Super Bowl, but um, how we got to the Super Bowl. And I work for that guy in the middle. I don't know if you could pick him out or not. His name is John Mabin. And um, Ace is the place and all that other stuff. And uh, Miller Light and uh, hey, hey, boom, ah. But I do have a story about it. We worked for 15 years together on radio. That's Dennis Steele on the right, John on the left. And that's me. Um, oh, or actually, yeah, I'm John's in the middle and I'm on the left. That's at Sync St Sound in Manhattan on 58th Street um and 10th avenue and um I, I don't know if you've ever heard the story from john uh, a guy by the name of michael frank used to travel with him and uh then joe john's son traveled with him and this is the drake hotel in chicago and when i was in chicago i had to take a picture of the drake hotel because uh, John is there on the bus and uh, they pull in and John's walking in with Michael Frank. They check in and they're going to whatever room they're going in. And in the elevator, there's this uh, English guy, this little English guy, little wiry English guy. And he looks and he says, Mr. Madden, Mr. Madden, I, I just want to shake your hand. Uh, John, by the way, John's hand was so big that he could no longer be a catcher in baseball because they couldn't find a catcher's mitt big enough for his hand. But anyway, so Mick Jack, oh, oh, whoops. So this guy, this English guy, he's uh, he's looking at John. He's looking at John. He's saying, you know, I just want to, you taught me American football. We're doing it. And, you know, it's great. I watch the games all the time. You, and Pat Summerall, is great. You've taught me everything about football. So he gets out of the um, elevator and goes to wherever he's going. And John turns to Michael Frank and he says, you know who that guy is? He says, yeah, I know. He says, well, who is he? He says, Mick Jagger, Mick Jagger, Mick Jagger. He says, you know, uh, Mick Jagger, uh, I can't get no satisfaction. He looks like he can't get no satisfaction. And then the Rolling Stones did the opening for ABC Monday Night Football and John comes in. Hey, we got this new group. They're singing the song for our Monday Night Football. I said, John, that's still the same guy that you didn't know in the elevator in Chicago. Zip. Anyway, John was responsible for a lot of people coming into football, not necessarily because of football, but he was everywhere. He was Miller Beer commercial and the Ace Hardware commercial and, and other things. And he hosted Saturday Night Live once. And um, so he helped popularized football and the national football league would not schedule its games until they got john's schedule for the first two or three weeks of the season he'd come to new york because he had all of his um, advertising deals so until john's schedule was cleared the nfl did not put out its schedule oh that's my ebook america's passion how a coal miners game became the nfl in the 20th century and it's available on Apple iTunes if you want it. And I always liked this picture. John was the one who um, told me, write a book. He said that uh, if you write a book, uh, it'll be good because I used to get these stories. And I'd look for the dirtiest picture I could. And this is the dirtiest picture I found. Uh, it's in Pittsburgh. It's the Brooklyn Dodgers against the Pittsburgh Pirates. Uh, and that's what the team's names were. Brooklyn had a team for about 15 years in the 30s and 40s, uh, played at Ebbets Field. And I love the referee. He looks like he's about ready to go out golfing. But uh, that's Benny Feathers, who played with the uh, Dodgers, carrying the football. And if you look real closely at the guy bringing him down, uh, it looks to be a little unnecessary roughness, maybe. And it's Pittsburgh, and that was Smoke City in the day, and it's always overcast. and. The elements are there. John always talked about the elements, the elements, and uniforms are dirty, and there's probably blood somewhere, and there's no face masks and leather helmets, and that was what the NFL was once about. From a mom and pop store to million, a multi-billion dollar business, the roots are in Western Pennsylvania in the coal mines. But the first game ever played was down in uh, New Jersey. It was Princeton against Rutgers in New Brunswick, and it was 1896, and the game doesn't resemble 
anything that you see today. And somewhere in that picture on the left side near the ground is the ball. Uh, Rutgers won the game. I don't know if there were prop bets, if there was over and under, and there was a point spread those days. Uh, probably not. Rutgers and uh, Princeton played the first game of intercollegiate football, and that was November 6, 1869. And the game was played with uh, two teams of 25 men each under rugby-like rules. Teams lined up, two members of each team remaining more or less stationary near the opponent's goal in the hopes of being able to slip over and score from unguarded positions. The remaining 23 players were divided into groups of 11 and 12. 11 fielders lined up in their own territory as defenders while the 12 Bulldogs carried the battle. In 1876, the first rules for American football were written, done so by Walter Camp, who would be known as the father of American football, and he first became involved with the game that year. Every year in New Haven, uh, roughly this time of year, there's the Walter Camp Awards to college players, and um, Walter Camp uh, is, uh, well, he comes back a little later with, with a little more emphasis, in fact, many years later, but Walter Camp was the guy who wrote the rules. Pudge Heffelfinger, one of the first players to get paid. The Allegheny Athletic Association, AAA, and the Pittsburgh Athletic Club, the PAC, uh, led to the making of the first professional football player. He's a former Yale All-American guard, played for Walter Camp, William Pudge Heffelfinger, and he was given 500 bucks, which I think today would be roughly the equivalent of about, uh, oh, I don't know, um, 150, no, about $10,500 by the uh, AAA to play in a game against the pack, becoming the first person ever to be paid for playing football. And this guy is 16 years old, and his name is John Brillier. And um, there was, uh, well, people wanted him to play. Uh, he's 16, it's 1895, he's a quarterback, and he became the first player to openly turn pro, accepting $10 in expenses to play for the Trobe Pennsylvania YMCA against the Jeanette Athletic Club. The Allegheny Athletic Association team fielded the first completely professional football team for a two-game season in 1896. You figured about 14 players, so probably, I don't know, somewhere between, say, 70 and, I don't know, maybe 140 bucks for the team. Uh, that is the Latrobe team in 1897, and there's some guy there with a derby um, in the middle of the row with an L on top of uh, a guy in a white shirt. Um, probably the guy in the three-piece suit. Uh, they are a professional football team. Uh, the Latrobe Athletic Association football team became the first uh, team to play a full season with just professionals in 1897. Now, Philadelphia had a team that was in 1899, and this team is kind of like, you know, the early day version of the Green Bay Packers, maybe. They were in Frankfurt, Pennsylvania, outside of Philadelphia. It was called the Frankfurt Athletic Association, organized in May of 1899. Uh, the cost of purchasing a share in the association was $10, which, you know, now maybe 300 bucks. However, there were also contributing memberships ranging from a buck to 250, and that was made available to the general public. Uh, in keeping with its charter, uh, which stated that all profits shall be donated to charity, all of the team's excess income was donated to local charity, uh, charitable institutions, the original Frankfurt Athletic Association disbanded prior to the start of the 1909 football season. The oldest team in the NFL is a team called the Morgan Athletic Club, but you know them better today as the Arizona Cardinals. Um, they were in Chicago, uh, and um, the Morgan Athletic Club was on the south side of Chicago, the baddest part of the town. The team uh, later became known as the Normals, then the Racine Cardinals for a street in Chicago, and then the Chicago Cardinals because they had cardinal red shirts. 
The team would relocate to St. Louis in 1960, becoming the St. Louis Cardinals. In 1988, the owner, Bill Bidwell, moved the team to Tempe, Arizona, named it the Phoenix Cardinals. 1994 was renamed the Arizona Cardinals. The team remains the oldest continuing operation in pro football. There was a league in 1902, and it was called the Chicago Football League. Uh, baseball's Philadelphia Athletics and the Philadelphia Phillies uh, formed professional football teams, joining the Pittsburgh Stars in the first attempt at a pro football league named the National Football League in 1902. The Chicago Football League was formed out of several local clubs, such as the Chicago Tigers, as well as some outside teams like the Hammond, Indiana team, and Rockford, and Decatur, and Racine, Illinois, and Milwaukee, Wisconsin. At the same time, there was the Ohio League and the New York State League. By 1904, Ohio had at least seven pro teams, with Maslin winning the professional title of the Ohio Independent Championship, uh, or the Ohio Independent Championship. By the way, Maslin still dominates football, but this time, high school football in Ohio. Um, Theodore Roosevelt and college football. Now, did Theodore Roosevelt save football or didn't he save football? It's a question that uh, remains pretty much unanswered after 119 years, but uh, here are the circumstances. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt threatened to ban football in America unless rules were implemented to make the game safer after a reported 40 players died from injuries suffered on the field over a two-year period in 1904 and 1905. But no one could actually figure out how Roosevelt could end the game because he just couldn't. However, the threat of a ban from the bully pulpit was enough to get changes in playing rules to make the game safer. Uh, the Roosevelt Initiative would eventually lead to the formation of the NCAA. Theodore Roosevelt brought the presidents of Harvard, Yale, and Princeton into the Oval Office, told them, fix the game or else. Of course, nobody else knew what or else meant. Um, Roosevelt hated the Harvard president, Charles Eliot. They just hated one another. Roosevelt it was a Harvard alum, and he hated the president. Uh, the Harvard contingent wanted to change football. Walter Camp, who wrote the rules back in 1876, and Yale said, let's keep it as is, Princeton was on the fence. But if you got newspapers during the fall uh, and when there was a reported death of a player, you got a cartoon similar to this. Sometimes the uh, skull and crossbones on the uh, uh, goalpost. This one... Um, a center, uh, snapping what looks like a watermelon-shaped football. And that's what it was. It was watermelon-shaped. Uh, the uh, shawl around the uh, neck says death. Behind uh, this guy, a uh, bunch of broken bodies, dead players on the football field. I demand that football changes its rules or be abolished. Change the game or forsake it. Uh, that's what Roosevelt said. His son, Theodore Roosevelt Jr., suffered major injuries in high school and college, but you know, T.R., he was a rugged outdoors man, but there was some pressure on him. Oh, why did he like football, though? Why did he try to save football? And what does this got to do with the Rough Riders who went up San Juan Hill, 1898, when Roosevelt was the assistant secretary of the Navy? And those were his guys that went up San Juan Hill. A soft spot for the game. Ten of the Rough Riders, the soldiers who fought with him in Cuba, gave their occupations as football players when they enlisted in 1898. Well, because of uh, the bully pulpit and getting these guys in the Oval Office, the American Football Rules Committee was formed in 1906. Plays designed to open up the game to make it less dangerous to play were introduced and you couldn't pick up players anymore and fling them. They did that. They picked up players and fling them because it was only five yards for a first down. And uh, sometimes you were just better off in throwing a player who would crash into somebody else. The committee passed legislation that led to the introduction of the forward pass. 
change the distance to be gained for first down from five yards to 10 yards. More importantly, all mass formations and gang tackling were banned. Uh, that's Jim Thorpe. And by the way, uh, here's a question that I may answer later on or not. Was the game made safer? I don't know. Jim Thorpe, Canton Bulldogs. 1915, Jack Cusick signed Jim Thorpe and his uh, Canton, uh, to his Canton uh, Bulldogs team, renamed his team. Uh, with Thorpe and the former Carlisle teammate Pete Catlack starring, Canton went 9-0-1 and won the Ohio League Championship. The Canton team was proclaimed Pro Football's Champions. That's Curly Lambeau. Today, uh, Lambeau Field is rather sacred in Green Bay. Uh, but uh, the whole lore of the Green Bay Packers came out of skullduggery and uh, marketing rights. Marketing rights. Uh, in 1919, Earl Curly Lambeau and George Calhoun organized the Green Bay Packers, whose namesake was Lambeau's employer, the Indian Packing Company, which provided $500 for equipment and allowed the team to use the company field for practices. The catch, you got to name them after us. It was the first marketing agreement of its kind, a naming rights. They didn't know what they were doing, or Carly Lambeau certainly didn't know what he was doing. But he invented naming rights. Um, the NFL's coming, but not yet. That is the uh, world champs, the Akron Professionals, 1920. And if you look very closely at your screen, at the lower right-hand level, you will see an African-American player by the name of Fritz Pollard. The NFL back in those days actually hired African-American players. And he's on the bottom row, last guy on the right side. It's when uh, Major League Baseball was not hiring Negro players. That's when the Negro National League of Baseball started in 1920. But um, the predecessor of the NFL, at least the name the NFL, said it's okay to have Negro players in the league. Well, why was there a need for a league? Well, there were leagues all over the place, Chicago, Ohio, New York, uh, all over the place. Football owners wanted to stop dramatically rising prices or salaries. Now, I spoke at the uh, Riverdale Y about 15 years ago, and there was this tall guy who uh, was there and came to all my talks, and um, we were talking about the Super Bowl, uh, one of my Super Bowl talks. And he said, I played with Staten Island in 1928, somewhere around there. I said, how much did you get paid? He said, $10, $10 per game. How many games you play? He said, about four or five. Uh, he said, when I mentioned rising salaries, he said, yeah, we went from $8 to $9. They couldn't afford it. He said, literally, they couldn't afford it because the money wasn't coming in. Players continually jumped from one team to another following the highest offer, and they used college players still enrolled in school. Uh, one of those players was a guy named George Trafton, and um, the former director of the Pro Football Hall of Fame, uh, John Bankard, who passed away a number of years ago, about 25 years ago, was telling me about this guy, uh, uh, Tip uh, Trafton. And he said uh, Trafton was playing with Chicago, one of those teams. And he said that um, he gets, he's playing a game and he has only four fingers. And the story goes is that a guy in college plays against him on Saturday. The next day, the guys are playing together and Trafton's playing with Chicago. He went to Notre Dame and this guy, wherever he went, was playing for the other team. The guy says, you look familiar. I don't know. I don't know. No, you look familiar. Um, yeah, it's funny. I played against the guy who only had four fingers yesterday. He looks a lot like you. No, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. It wasn't me. They used to wear masks across their face to hide their identities because they didn't lose want to lose college eligibility. The uh, Akron Pros, Canton Bulldogs, Cleveland Indians, Dayton Triangles at a meeting in Canton, Ohio, August 20th, 1920. Uh, form the American Professional Football Conference. The second meeting followed with teams from Ohio, Indiana, New York, and Illinois in attendance, at which time the league changed its name 
to the American Professional Football Association. Uh, by the way, Trafton, take a look at that uh, Decatur Stanley team uh, in the first row. George Hellas is in the middle. To George Hellas is right. The guy at the end of the row looking left is George Trafton. And, and you can't see his fingers, but he's missing a finger on his uh, right hand. Uh, the Chicago Bears start 1921. Another, hey, naming rights deal, except they didn't know about naming rights deals in those days. Uh, start 1921, A.E. Stanley turned the Decatur Staley's over to the player coach George Hallis, who moved the team to Cubs Park in Chicago. Now, at that point, George Hallis was better known as the right fielder in 1919 of the New York Yankees. And uh, he lost his job in 1920. I, I, he lost his job to some obscure baseball player uh, by the name of George Herman Ruth, who became known as Babe Ruth. I've never heard of him. Did you, have you ever heard of Babe Ruth? That's who Hallis uh, lost his job to as a Yankee right fielder. Staley paid the Hallis $5,000 to keep the name Staley's for one more year. Hallis made halfback etched. Ed Dutch Sternerman, his partner, another naming rights deal. And there was Fritz Pollard. Uh, he earned a place in pro football history as just one of two African Americans in the new league. 1921, he earned another distinction, becoming the first African American head coach in NFL history when the Akron Pro's ownership named him co coach of the team. This is what Pollard had to say at the time. It was evident in my first year at Akron and back in 1919, they didn't want blacks in there getting that money. And here I was playing and coaching and pulling down the highest salary in pro football. Within a couple of years, uh, the NFL would start weeding out all African-American players to the point where there were no African-American players in the league. There, are the, there's the Green Bay Packers back with uh, Curly Lambeau. Uh, 1922, Green Bay withdrew from the APFA after admitting using players who had college eligibility remaining during the 1921 season. Promising to obey league rules, Curly Lambeau used $50 of his own money to buy back the franchise. He went broke. And this is the story of the Green Bay Packers. Local merchants arranged a $2,500 loan for the club and a public nonprofit corporation was set up to operate the team. There's still 102 years later, that nonprofit corporation. Red Grange was the huge star of college football back in 1925. He was up there. He was up there with Jack Dempsey and Babe Ruth and Al Jolson, Rudolph Valentino, um, the absolute stars of the 20th century, the absolute top of the tops. Uh, late in the 1925 season, the NFL gained national recognition when the All-American halfback, Harold Redgrange, before his college eligibility was up at the University of Illinois, signed a contract to play with the Chicago Bears. It really didn't matter. George Hallis was running the league, and whatever he said went, and that's what happened there. The Grange signing clearly violated NFL rules uh, against signing players before they compete, uh, completed their college eligibility. But Hellas didn't care. He saw money in this. Uh, the signing of Red Grange and the subsequent national barnstorming tour of the Bears team may have saved the NFL in the 1920s. On Thanksgiving, a crowd of 36,000, the largest pro football crowd ever. Watch Red Grange and the Chicago Bears play the Chicago Cardinals at Wrigley Field. At the beginning of December, the Bears went on an eight game, 12 day barnstorming tour in St. Louis, Philadelphia, New York, Washington, Boston, Pittsburgh, Detroit, then back to Chicago. Now, I don't know how many of the people in here are New York Giants fans, if you want to, uh, uh, type in that you're a New York Giants fan, feel free. Uh, but New York Giants should retire the number 77 in honor of Red Grange because without Red Grange coming in to play the Giants with his Chicago Bears teammates, 
there would be no New York Giants franchise today. Uh, there was a crowd of 73,000 that crowded into the polo grounds uh, to watch the Giants play the Bears. And the proceeds from that crowd went into Tim Mara's pocket. Tim Mara was a bootlegger and a gambler. And there were a lot of bootleggers and gamblers back in the early days of the NFL. In fact, Mike Ditka told me that uh, he heard stories about uh, Al Capone with the Chicago Cardinals being a friend of the owner of the Chicago Cardinals. And, and uh, certainly in New York, Bill, Big Bill uh, Dwyer, who is a bootlegger on the Brooklyn Dodgers, uh, team Mara bootlegger and also a uh, uh, numbers runner in Pittsburgh, Art Rooney, bought his football team with the proceeds of a big day at Aqueduct Racetrack. Um, so anyway, Mara had all that money and was able to go into 1926. That pro uh, football polo grounds record was beaten when the Bears defeated the Los Angeles Tigers in the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum in front of 75,000 fans. Now, there has been a dispute still out there 99 years later of who won the NFL championship in 1925. The Potsdam Maroons, the legendary team played as a member of the National Football League here, 1925 to 1928. In 1925, the Maroons compiled a record widely viewed as the league's best. They climaxed their season by defeating Notre Dame in a well-publicized pro versus college match in Philadelphia. But they were then denied the NFL championship in a controversial league decision. Despite strong regional support, the franchise moved to Boston in 1929. That would be right before the stock market crash. But it's December 6, 1925, and the Pottsville Maroons beat the Chicago Cardinals in what was widely considered to be the 1925 NFL Championship game. The Maroons had a 9-2 record. Chicago, 9-1-1, one one, heading into the showdown with the Maroons. The NFL did not have an official championship game. Despite finishing the 1925 season with the best record in the NFL, Pottsville was not awarded a league championship, and it all came down to money. After beating Chicago, Pottsville was eager to cash in on its exhibition game against former Notre Dame College Stars. The game was played at Shy Park in Philadelphia, which was the uh, home of the uh, Philadelphia Athletics in those days. Uh, the Frankfurt Yellow Jackets of, the, of Major League Baseball. The Frankfurt Yellow Jackets lodged the protest with the NFL. Frankfurt claimed that Pottsville was violating the Yellow Jackets territory, drawing fans away from the Frankfurt game scheduled for the same day. The NFL president, Joseph Carr, agreed with the Frankfurt protest. Prior to the Pottsville Notre Dame match, Carr had warned the Maroons three times not to play the game. Carr fined Pottsville $500, suspended the team's right to the championship, and revoked the Pottsville franchise. Chris O'Brien, the owner of the Chicago Cardinals, said that he would only accept uh, the title if it was clearly won on the field of play. The NFL recognizes Chicago as the 1925 champion, and no jawboning from any senator out of Washington has ever changed uh that uh grange in the american football league well red grange was such a drawing card give us a franchise in new york nfl said no they were protecting tim mara the la wildcats began with the formation of the uh american football league by cc pile one of the first sports agents who represented the star red grange and uh, in 1926, uh, C.C. Pyle got together a league, the American Football League, to showcase Red Grange. Armed with a five-year lease at Yankee Stadium, Pyle subsequently announced the formation of the American Football League that would be the showcase for his client. L.A. was a road team. They never played in L.A. Uh, the first NFL team was in 1926 in Los Angeles. Uh, and their team's name was the Los Angeles Buccaneers. 
This was a road team based in Chicago, made up of Californians, primarily University of California and University of Southern California alum. Now, there should have been one guy on this team by the name of Marion Morrison. Uh, he went to USC, except he got into a fight with his coach after breaking a collarbone uh, water skiing, and he was kicked off the team. Well, this guy decided, Marion Morris, Morrison, to see if he could find a job as a stuntman in the movies. And, uh, well, he went to the Fox lot and he found a job and you probably know him better today as a guy by the name of john wayne he could have been on that team the buccaneers did play two true home games in los angeles both of them exhibition games against the new york yankees january 1927 the buccaneers also played two games in san francisco including the last game of the buccaneers existence an exhibition game against the afl's los angeles wildcats one of the problems in Los Angeles is the Los Angeles Coliseum said so we don't want any pro teams. Football salaries range between $75 and $100 per game, according to that guy who I met 15 years ago. Uh, no, it wasn't that high. Um, he got like $8 a game. The average ticket price was less than a buck. The typical team roster was about 15 players. Revenues were initially generated solely through paid attendance and related concessions. The standard game uh, contract provided for a guaranteed payment to the visiting team, about $1,000 in the early 1920s, against the visitor's cut of 40% of the gate receipts after deducting 15% for rental and maintenance of the field, and teams came and went. Now, the fiercest rivalry in the nfl remains the chicago bears and green bay packers now you might want to take note in new york uh with the afc east where giants fans will tell you depending on the year dallas washington and philadelphia are their most hated rivals with the best team the most hated at top if you go to washington it's dallas philadelphia new york you go to Philadelphia, it's New York, Dallas, and Washington. But, uh, and it used to be the Raiders in Kansas City in the American Football League, but it wasn't like this one. This one was the original one. By 1931, because of the Depression, the NFL decreased to 10 teams and only eight teams, the lowest in NFL history in 1932. Small market Green Bay, small market Green Bay, big market Chicago, George Hallis was having problems meeting his payroll. So uh, he uh, gets a hold of his old uh, nemesis and colleague, Curly Lambeau, and says, uh, hey, uh, give me some money so I can meet the payroll. And Curly Lambeau uh, got an IOU from George Hallis, and the IOU is in the, the Green Bay Packers Hall of Fame, uh, saying, I owe you 1500 bucks. It is thought that Curly Lambeau saved the Chicago Bears franchise back in the early 1930s. Uh, the Frankfurt Yellow Jackets went out of business again. That's the 1926 champions. And uh, they, uh, <laughs> they would have had a problem playing in the NFL today. They joined the league in 1924 because of blue loss. The team's home games played on Saturday. Congressionally, you can't, uh, because of TV and all this other stuff, the NFL cannot play uh, games against colleges and high school football in September, October, and November. So they would have had a problem today. The Yellow Jackets won the 1926 NFL championship before the start of the 31 season. Frankfurt Stadium was severely damaged by a fire forcing the club to find another location for its home games. The Yellow Jackets played at Philadelphia's Municipal Stadium in the Baker Bowl. Uh, the team had hoped to draw broad support from Philadelphia at large. Team folded after the season. The Philadelphia Eagles entered the league in 1933, and uh, I'm not going to be political, politically correct here. Uh, the Philadelphia Eagles were named after the uh, National Recovery Act and the uh, Roosevelt uh, logo for the National Recovery Act, which was an eagle. They named themselves after a Roosevelt program, 
entering the league in 1933. You got to be a football hero uh, to win all the beautiful girls. Now, early Hollywood movies were based on the college game. Horse Feathers, the Marx Brothers, my favorite uh, sports movie. Well, maybe Slapshot, but this is up there with Slapshot. Um, when I give talks on football or sports business at colleges, I want the students to spend 66 minutes to watch Horse Feathers. And you probably have Horse Feathers in the library. That's with the Marx Brothers, the four Marx Brothers. Uh, Groucho, Chico, Harpo, and Zeppo. It was written in... 1932, 92 years ago, it lampooned college sports. Quincy Adams Wagstaff, the new president of Huxley University, accidentally, well, he goes to a speakeasy looking for football players and instead hires Baravelli and Pinky, Chico and Harpo, to help his school win the big football game against the rival Darwin University. And I, I kind of use this movie to set the students up to talk about college sports because uh, Wagstaff is now the president of the college. And uh, he said that, uh, do we have a college? Yes. Do we have a football team? Yes. Well, you can't have both. So let's get rid of the college. Uh, and then one of the professors said, uh, well, where will the students uh, sleep then? In the classroom. Then it goes, it's one of those graduates. Uh, Mickey Mouse and Popeye were subjects of the first two football cartoons. And this is You Gotta Be a Football Hero to Get Along with the Beautiful Girls by Al Sherman, Buddy Fields, and a different Al Lewis, not Grandpa from uh, the uh, Munsters or Schnauzer from Car 54, Where Are You? Uh, and uh, featured by B.A. Rolfe and his orchestra. You got to be a football hero. Look at those guys. Zeppo, Groucho, Harpo, and Chico. Uh, touchdown. Mickey gets into the end zone. And there, of course, is the love triangle over olive oil. Uh, this guy, G.A. Richards. Uh, G.A. Richards is important in broadcasting history in that um, he had WJR in Detroit. He had W. Um, uh, G-A-R in Cleveland. He put Father Coughlin on the air. Um, you know, hate radio. He started hate radio, but he was also a football announcer, a uh, football owner. Uh, in 1935, uh, W-J-R radio station owner G.A. Dick Richards purchased the Portsmouth Spartans, moved them to Detroit, renamed them the Lions. Richards convinced the NFL to allow the Lions and the defending world champions Chicago Bears to play for the Western Division Championship on Thanksgiving. And with that, he said, I got all these radio contacts. You don't. We'll put the game on the air. And they did. Uh, Richards convinced uh, David Sarnoff and NBC that they should broadcast this game on radios across the U.S. And the game was a huge success. Sellout crowd, 26,000 broadcast across the nation over 94 different radio stations. In 1934, the NFL discovered media as a run-of-view run revenue generator. Within five years, the NFL is on TV. The second incarnation of the American Football League, AFL-2, becomes a rival to the NFL in 1936. At that point, the NFL had nine teams and played in many of the largest population centers except Green Bay, and the AFL uh, competed directly with the NFL in many of those cities. The AFL folds, but uh, the NFL takes in the AFL's Cleveland Rams in 1937, and Boston moves to Washington that year. A third American Football League played in 1940 and 1941, but that league ended with the bombing of Pearl Harbor, and none of the teams were successful anyway. Oh, I don't know how much money is going to be spent on betting for the Super Bowl in Las Vegas uh, on February 11th. Uh, that guy was John F. Kennedy's math teacher at Riverdale uh, Day School uh, over in the Bronx. He's a University of Chicago graduate. Really, really smart guy with numbers. Really smart guy with numbers. His name, Charles K. McNeil, and he invented the point spread. Uh, he was a compulsive gambler, and um, hey, look, he should be in the Hall of Fame as a builder, all the Hall of Fames. 
Um, in the 1930s, Charles K. McNeil may have invented the point spread, which made the outcome of football games more interesting than just the final score for betters. It's not known if McNeil came up with the idea or borrowed it, but it was McNeil who refined it and opened up a new, albeit illegal, industry. People bet on scores, not which team won. The greatest team name ever in football is the Steagles. And that was a combination of the Philadelphia Eagles and the Pittsburgh Steelers, World War II. And the NFL was literally in survival mode. Now, Major League Baseball, the Roosevelt green leather, uh, green light leather went out in 1942. He sent it to Kennesaw Mountain Landis, who asked for directions. What should Major League Baseball do? And Roosevelt sent the commissioner of baseball this leather, urging, not saying playing, just urging playing. Dan Rooney, who was the uh, head of the uh, Pittsburgh Steelers, the owner of the Steelers, and I talked about that green light leather one day, and he said, we never got it, but we just assumed if Roosevelt urged them to play, we could play. But Pittsburgh was a major problem. The team survived by recruiting retired players or using college players. Teams located near Army and Navy bases uh, could use players stationed near their cities. Pittsburgh was a problem. No nearby military bases. 1943, Art Rooney merged his team with Philadelphia to get players who were stationed at nearby military bases of Philadelphia Naval Yard. 1944, Rooney did the same, merged his team with the Chicago Cardinals, uh, same reason. If the war had continued into 1945, he had a deal with the Brooklyn Dodgers, again, the ports of New York and West Point around, uh, and they would have played together, but there was the bombing of Pearl Harbor, so he didn't have to deal with that. Uh, the American All-American Football Conference in the Color Barrier. NFL still a mom and pop operation in 1946, but they get competition from a new league. Black or Negro players would return to NFL rosters in 1946 for the first time in 13 years, but there would be a quota on Negro players taking roster spots. That is Woody Strode, and he was a member of the Los Angeles Rams, and behind him, well, there's Kirk Douglas, and somewhere in that line is a guy by the name of Bertie Schwartz, who you probably know better as Tony Curtis. Uh, Dan Reeves moves the Cleveland Rams to L.A. in 1946 under the condition that he hires Negro players as part of the lease agreement with the L.A. Coliseum Commission. Uh, San Francisco 49ers franchise started playing in the AAFC in 1946, would join the NFL with two other teams from that league in 1950. But breaking the color barrier, it's Kenny Washington, wildly known to be the best player not to be in the NFL. Everybody wanted him, but there was this little matter of the color barrier. Um, he came, came out of college in 1939. He ended up playing uh, with the Rams in 1946, played in the Pacific Coast League. Jackie Robinson was also part of the Pacific Coast League of football back uh, in the, during that time period. Well, the Cleveland Rams owner, Daniel Reeves, had agreed to hire Negroes in 1946, part of his agreement to move to the Los Angeles Coliseum, despite other NFL owners' opposition, particularly George Preston Marshall, in Washington, who would tell you that he is a racist without any problems. George Preston Marshall also dated the silent film star Louise Brooks for a while and was her uh, agent. He was a laundry man who hit it big. Uh, Reeves hires Kenny Washington and Woody Strode. Meanwhile, there's this new league, the AAFC, and that's Paul Brown. That's Marion Motley, and around 1988-89, I was talking to Paul Brown about the, about breaking the color barrier, and he said, I didn't care. You know, football player is a football player. I didn't care if he's white, if he's black, if he's a Martian. I didn't care. Or he had polka dots. If he could play football, he was on my team. Bill Willis was also on that team, hired by Paul Brown. They became teammates and lifelong friends, but even Paul Brown had a limit to what he was going to expose these guys to. Uh, they endured taunts, racial slurs, dirty play from opponents on the field, and Paul Brown kept them home from a game at Miami in 1946 because of death threats. 
their teammates welcomed them. As a semi-pro operation in the 1950s, Stan Jones, he was a guard with the Chicago Bears, and he and I talked about the semi-pro operation. Uh, some of, if you're a New York Giant fan, you know that uh, the number 81 is retired. It's Andy Robustelli's number. He started with the Los Angeles Rams. He had two businesses in Stanford, Connecticut, the travel agency and a sporting goods company. And the league played 12 games, but they also had eight weeks of training camp. And if you got to the championship game, that would mean that you're away from your business 21 weeks and you weren't getting paid for the eight weeks of training camp. Uh, so he requested a trade back east or he was going to retire. Well, the Rams took care of him. They sent him to the Giants. NFL has 13 teams in 1950. NFL was a semi-pro league. Stan Jones, an offensive lineman with the Chicago Bears, would finish the season in December and look for another job. We weren't a full-time operation. A lot of people don't realize that. The football teams closed up after the last game of the year and packed everything away, and George Hallis wasn't a full-time football man himself. Most players weren't even paid during the eight weeks of training camp in the 1950s. In fact, the players didn't even have their own equipment except for shoes, and the team shared all the equipment. Now, the shoes became uh, popular because the guys who were cut or let go would sell their shoes back to um, the players uh, who would sell the shoes to incoming guys with a little bit of a markup so they could drink some beer, buy some beer with the markup. And that's the way the NFL was in those days. Frank Trapuca, who lived over in Montclair, New Jersey, uh, Francis Trapuca, who I knew rather well, went to his house a number of times, was not impressed with the NFL, played with the Chicago Cardinals. A lot of people think, even in those days, the National Football League was the almighty league, but it really wasn't. The National Football League in those days was haphazard. I was totally disenchanted with football, so I came back here to Bloomfield, New Jersey to call it quits, and I get a call from Saskatchewan, Canadian Football League. And the fellow says, what would it take uh, to you, uh, take you to come up here and play? I'm making a big $12,000 at the time, so I hurriedly said, $25,000, and he said, you got it. That was the year they opened up the Canadian League to eight Americans. Prior to that, they only had three Americans on each team. Well, that competition would end by 1956, and Americans who were going up there came back. They weren't paying, not because they couldn't afford it. The NFL cut a deal with them, and the Americans came back. George Hallis was running the NFL in the 1950s as Chicago Bears owner and uh, coach. He was the founder and pretty much ran the league, said Tribuca. Many a time we used to kid on the field on the sideline. Now the referee would reach into his pocket and first look over on the sideline to George Hallis. If Hallis didn't give him any sign, he'd throw the flag. If Hallis shook his head, no, he wouldn't throw the flag. Green Bay needs a stadium. And George Hallis needs to help out the Green Bay Packers Board of Directors. The Chicago Bears owner and coach George Hallis used to travel up to small Wisconsin towns in the offseason to help raise money so the Green Bay Packers had enough funds to play from year to year. Those fundraisers also took place in the 1950s. By the 1950s, the Green Bay Stadium was seen as too small and inadequate even after expansion. The leaders of the NFL, including Hallis, gave the Packers board an ultimatum. Build a new stadium or move to Milwaukee full-time. In Milwaukee, they were playing in a uh, racetrack. And then, all of a sudden, Milwaukee got a new stadium in 1953. And Green Bay was playing two to three of its annual six home games there. The residents of Green Bay responded by approving a bond issue in April 1956 to build a new city stadium which opened the following year as the old city stadium became a high school field. Television becomes a big deal. You know, the NFL is fueled by television today, but uh, back in the late 1940s, you could get some money, but not all that much money. Admiral TV was looking to sell TVs. I don't know how, how many of you uh, owned an Admiral TV, but they're looking to sell TVs. And in Los Angeles, they cut a deal with the Rams um, that uh, the Rams would put 
all 12 of their games on TV. And Admiral would sponsor it with the idea that Admiral would sell televisions. Well, it was great for Admiral, but it wasn't really great for the Rams' ownership. The Rams franchise drew more than 300,000 fans to home games in 1949. 1950, all the games are televised. The team's attendance drops by 50%. The NFL commissioner, Burke Bell, suggests NFL teams should not televise home games. The blackout rule is still being debated somewhat in Washington. The FCC is suggesting the rule comes to the end, but it's still there. Uh, Burke Bell, there is the commissioner of the NFL. Uh, so don't televise your home games. Uh, but he did. Uh, they did. And then they did it. Uh, and then the blackout rule was imposed. Dumont and Sports, the Dumont Television Network. If you're within the sound of my voice and you go to Montclair State College over in New Jersey and you go over to the Media Center, it is called Dumont Television. And what they've done is they've taken new TVs and whatever they could find of old Dumont shows. Unfortunately, a lot of Dumont shows ended up in the East River. That's a long story, but a lawyer threw him into the East River because of bickering between Paramount and, and uh, Metro Media, and he got sick of it, so he just got rid of television history of the 1940s and 50s. On December 23rd, 1951, Dumont televised the first ever live coast-to-coast -coast professional football game, the NFL championship game between the Los Angeles Rams and Cleveland Browns. Dumont paid $75,000 for the rights to broadcast the game, Super Bowl, if it ever went out to bid, would get on its own a billion dollars today, at least a billion dollars. Uh, 1952, Dumont aired only New York Giants games before moving to a more national scope the following season. During the 53 and 54 seasons, Dumont broadcast Saturday night NFL games. First time the NFL games were televised live coast to coast in prime time for the entire season. In 1953, Dumont televised a uh, Thanksgiving NFL game between the Detroit Lions and the Chicago Bears. Uh, Dumont today is uh, remembered as a purveyor of uh, cheap TV, low-budget TV. Very unfair. Um, they were cutting edge. They had the first uh, newscast. They couldn't dip into uh, radio network. They didn't have it. They had Jackie Gleason. They had Ted Max Amateur Hour. Uh, Bishop uh, Fulton Sheen, and they also had the NFL. They were very, very cutting edge, and all the networks were low budget at that time for the most part. By 1955, the Dumont Network was beginning to crumble. NBC replaced Dumont as the network for the NFL championship game, paying a rights fee of $100,000. ABC acquired the rights to the Thanksgiving game that uh, Dumont was supposed to have. Television. Television creates the National Football League with this game, the 58 championship game, the world's um, the greatest game ever. Although Artie Donovan, who is not in this picture, told me we were terrible that day. We should have killed them. It's Johnny Unitas. The National Football League was in the right place at the right time. There's no better TV game than football. A viewer can see everything as it develops on the field. The line of scrimmage, the quarterback handing off, passing the ball, receiver catching it. It's an easy game to watch. And it didn't hurt that the New York Giants won a world championship in 1956 and played in the greatest game of all time in 1958, losing in the NFL championship game to Johnny Unitas and the Baltimore Colts. That game started the lasting love affair between Americans and football and was aided by the handsome Frank Gifford and defense, 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 and Madison Avenue fell in love with the New York Giants. If you were a Giant and you didn't get a, um, an endorsement, you were doing something wrong. Greatest game ever played, December 8th, 1958. The Colts beat the Giants in overtime at Yankee Stadium. That's another big deal. Johnny Unitas drove his team down the field in overtime. The game ended when Ellen Amici took a handoff and plowed into the end zone. The game caught the attention of the American public. After watching the game, this 23-year-old guy from uh, a rich family, Lamar Hunt, decided if he couldn't join the NFL, and he was trying with an expansion team, he would form a rival circuit, the American Football League. There is Sam Huff, defense, defense, defense. Brawn, brains, and prof, uh, profits. 
that uh, from 1960 or so, 1959, Sam Hupp, the first NFL player ever on the cover of Time Magazine. CBS Weekly Documentary ran a program uh, called The Violent World of Sam Hupp, narrated by old Iron Pants himself, Walter Cronkite. Hupp, the Giants' middle linebacker, was profiled and Mike during a preseason game in Montreal against Pittsburgh to give the viewers an inside look during the game. Sam told me that uh, everybody knew he was mic'd up, so players would give him an extra shot or two because they wanted to be on TV. Uh, Pete Rozelle comes into the picture as the commissioner of the National Football League in 1960. This is a picture from 1986. That is Pete, that is me in the background when I used to wear a sport coat and a tie. Um, this was during the USFL-NFL trial, and uh, somebody must have said something funny because he's smiling and I'm smiling. Roselle and the Jolt. CBS paid $500,000 to the owners of the Chicago Cardinals to help move that franchise to St. Louis. The money allegedly went to the Cardinals to move temporary seating from Comiskey Park in Chicago to Bush Stadium in St. Louis so that the CBS local affiliate in Chicago could run a full slate of Chicago Bears road games, uh, which were blacked out because the Cardinals franchise was playing Sunday afternoon home games. Uh, the Cardinals franchise did move a couple games to Minneapolis and Buffalo so they could open up the TV market somewhat. Remember, uh, don't televise your home games. Neither the Bears nor the Cardinals were seen much on local Chicago TV because of the blackout rule. The only time that Chicago games were on TV was when the Bears and Cardinals were on the road together. The Chicago Cardinals franchise played only four games a year in Chicago during the team's final seasons in the city with two home games farmed out to Minneapolis or Buffalo. Uh, oh, there is the handsome Frank Gifford. I once did talk, actually, this football talk in Fairfield, Connecticut, at a place, a uh, senior residence, and a woman there is giving me this look. I said, what's wrong? Oh, he was a bad boy. He was a bad boy. I said, what? He, well, the Giants were at Fairfield University. Giants practiced, or their training camp was at Fairfield University, and apparently uh, she kept some time with Frank Gifford, and she was gushing. This was 1962, gushing all over the place about Frank Gifford. They were the darlings of Madison Avenue. Handsome Frank Gifford, 20th century, hosted by Walter Cronkite, caught the football bug. Uh, pro football in the 60s is entirely changed between 58 and 66. The Continental League had an impact. Branch Rickey wants to start the third league. Went to the Lamar Hunt in Dallas. You want franchise? No but he took Branch Rickey's playbook, applied it to the American Football League. Television, Congress, President Kennedy's impact on the NFL, 1961 Sports Broadcast Act, a bidding war between the two leagues after the NFL, AFL rather, got money from uh, David Sarnoff and NBC, and then there was the 1966 merger and the formation of the New Orleans Saints as uh, the NFL had to trade a franchise to Congress to get Russell Long's approval in the Senate from Louisiana and Hale Boggs' approval in uh, Congress, uh, Cokie Roberts' father, uh, for the merger. So the NFL and the horse trade said, we'll give you the franchise, give us the merger. And that's what happened. JFK, assassinated on November 22nd, 1963, left one permanent impression on the sports world. He created a massive revenue stream for sports owners from television, signing the Sports Broadcast Act of 1961. Kennedy was not responsible for the actual legislation. The Brooklyn Congressman Emanuel Seller wrote the bill, gets no credit these days for changing the sports landscape in the United States. The uh, Seller bill allowed the National Football League to market its broadcast rights as a league package, evenly spreading the broadcasting revenues among the franchises and guaranteeing each team substantial annual revenues. There is Emanuel Seller who got to Congress in 1922. The act would also apply to the National Basketball Association, National Hockey League, other sports. Major League Baseball had an antitrust exemption, didn't need the federal law, as the American and National East could sell the product, baseball, as one to the networks that 
antitrust exemption thanks to a 1922 Supreme Court ruling. Uh, the game changer was Pete Gogolak. Um, he was a Buffalo Bills kicker, and he goes to the New York Giants. Jumps. The NFL and the Giants called. I signed with the Giants and made three times as much as I made with the Bills. I signed for $35,000. They gave me a four-year no-cut contract. I went to the Giants, and the team wasn't as good as the Bills. Then you know what happened. The AFL started calling NFL players. The war started in Basically, a few months later, the two leagues merged, so maybe I started something. I not only started the soccer-style kick, but maybe I started the merger. There's Pete, Alvin, Roy, Pete, Brownsell, as how it goes, so I used to call him. NFL, AFL. Uh, Namath makes the Super Bowl important. Super Bowl one and two have minimal impact. In fact, they weren't even called the Super Bowl. It was the American Football League, National Football League, World Championship game. Joe Namath and the Jets win Super Bowl III, according to the NFL Hall of Fame player, Ron Mix. And we were sitting in a hotel room in San Diego when he told me this, uh, who played 10 years in the AFL with the Los Angeles-San Diego Chargers franchise. The Namath-led victory uh, over the NFL's Baltimore Colts was a validation of AFL players' careers in the AFL. And there is Joe Namath with me on the right. Bruce Morton on the left, and Weeb Eubank, the coach, sitting there to uh, Joe's right, Bruce's left. Uh, the Jets-Colts game is the turning point. Joe Namath guarantees the Jets will win. He delivers. More importantly, because of Namath and the name change to Super Bowl three, the Super Bowl begins to take on a new life. There was a flimsy pregame show featuring a marching band, Apollo 8 astronauts, Frank Borman, William Anders, Jim Lovell, who just circled the moon two weeks earlier, led the crowd in the Pledge of Allegiance, national anthem performed by a trumpet player, Lloyd Geisler. The uh, Florida A&M University marching band performed the halftime show. And there is the program from that game. Jets' victory is arguably the most important win in NFL history. It put the AFL on par with the established league. The NFL suddenly had a hot property, the Super Bowl, and that would become a quasi-national holiday and the most watched TV event of the year. There is Namath going into the locker room after the Jets won. How it goes, so, and there is Keith Jackson and the Dandaroo, Don Meredith. Keith Jackson once told me if he stayed on Monday Night Football, he would have died because he couldn't keep up with the drinking between the Dandaroo and How it goes. So, Howard and I had a relationship. Television contracts in the 1970s gave teams more money. The World Football League's challenge to the NFL leads to Seattle and Tampa Bay getting teams. The uh, Players Association and the NFL owners had wars. Uh, growing pains in the 1980s. I'm there right in the middle of that uh, picture uh, interviewing Harvey Meyerson. Donald Trump took the uh, USFL, uh, got the owners to agree to sue the NFL on an antitrust uh, charge. He won, but lost the money. Uh, Harvey had a little problem a little later on. Teamed up with the baseball commissioner, Bowie Kuhn, to form a uh, law company by the name of Meyerson and Kuhn. And uh, they bilked their clients. Harvey ended up in jail along with uh, Dan Cooper. I like Dan Cooper. He was a nice guy. He ended up in jail. Dan Cooper ended up in jail. And Bowie Kuhn ended up in uh, Florida hiding. And the USFL got their three bucks, to which Donald Trump once said, it's just small potatoes. Trump hired Harvey Meyerson after Roy Cohn was supposed to be their attorney. And uh, Roy got AIDS, and he hired Harvey, who... Had some problems later on. 1980s, uh, 82, the NFL players go on strike. 83, the USFL started. USFL antitrust suit with the NFL starts in 1986. Uh, 1987, NFL players go on strike, yet the game's popularity skyrockets. And uh, TV enriches owners and players. Rupert Murdoch and Fox in the TV contract, 1983, enriched owners and players. NFL becomes a political force in Arizona over the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Make it a state holiday and you get a Super Bowl. MLK Day 
becomes official in 1992. Uh, franchise movement, 90s, LA Rams to St. Louis, the Raiders from uh, uh, LA to Oakland, Cleveland to Baltimore, Houston to Nashville. Brain injuries. Uh, the other day, uh, front office sports uh, released a, a transcript of a Roger Goodell, who's the commissioner of the NFL, a deposition in uh, 2022 where Goodell basically is still carrying the uh, league line. We do not see any link between brain injuries, playing football and brain injuries. I have spoken to guys who have had the barrels of guns in their mouths thinking of committing suicide because their lives become miserable. Most of these guys who play for a long time, who suffer concussions or other injuries, their lives become miserable. And the NFL takes care of them for about five years, and then they end up on Medicaid. Uh, and Colin Kaepernick, uh, you know, that was a cultural divide about five years ago. Now you get the cultural divide over Taylor Swift, of all things. Taylor Swift. It's a good thing they weren't around in the 1950s when Jane Russell was married to the Rams quarterback, Bob Worthyfield, and showed up at all the games, Jane Russell. It's nothing new, a star and a football player. You gotta be a football hero to attract all the beautiful girls, right? It's a well-oiled machine. Concussions remain a problem. Uh, there's now a cultural divide because of Taylor Swift. I don't get that. Uh, you know, there were more important problems like the guys you're going to watch on the field next Sunday, one or two of them are going to be in bad shape years from now because of brain injuries. TV and streaming revenue services want the product because they hit men between 18 and 54. The advertisers can reach that audience. And billions of uh, TV and sh dollar streaming money, NBC Peacock paid $110 million for a playoff game this year. Uh, go into NFL owners' pockets and, of course, the players' pockets. So that's the NFL today, from the coal miners' game to a big business. And I did survive an Oakland Raiders party. Uh, that's Big Ben Davidson, who broke Joe Namath's jaw. That is Sandra Fortunato, me, and Phil Filippiano, who can be, I think he is certifiably crazy. He's, he needs to be checked out a little bit. But anyway, I survived the party. So thank you so much. Any questions, any comments? The floor is all yours. Thank you, Evan. And thank you, everyone, for Zooming in. And uh, we'll see you again uh, on the next talk. Yeah, well, we, we'll see if we can arrange another one. Certainly, certainly. So, and I want to thank everybody for being here tonight. Thank you for taking your time out to listen to me.